All right, well, uh, uh, I'm off the reservation now, and now you're off the reservation. Um, I have a view of where we're going with cities that is, uh, diverges from uh, a lot of the conventional thinking about it, including uh, the CNU uh, conventional thinking about it. And I tend to want to take a longer view of where, where we're heading and what the implications of it are. Because I, I think that without understanding that, uh, we're just going to keep on repeating a lot of foolish behavior. Um, okay, so that was, you know, the, that was sort of the utopian moment of the 1930s, you know, the, the idea that uh, this great turbo-industrial colossus was just going to keep on getting bigger and shinier. And uh, uh, meanwhile, on the ground, something's happening, you know, we're in a very short period after the development of the, the uh, Ford assembly line, we're approaching, like 10 years later, we're approaching criticality in the cities, and the cities are uh, becoming unmanageable on the ground. Around. And that prompts us into the set of iterations of the uh, the uh, the utopia that includes the automobile. And this is one of the early ones, you know, the uh, sep great separation of the pedestrian and the automobile. Going to cram all that stuff along with the subways under the, the grade of the street and have the people walking in the si on the skyways and. And uh, then that was elaborated about 10 years later uh, in this uh, illustration of Park Avenue with even more, e even, uh, uh, more elaborate uh, provisions for all the vehicles. And that, you know, that, that actually didn't quite work out the way that we thought it was going to work out. Um, I'm rushing through these because it's not that important to comment on the content of them, except to say that they, none of them really captured the reality of the future of most of the cities in the USA. This was the uh, uh, George Jetson vintage uh, uh, yesterday's tomorrow idea of the future. Um, all it really shows is that the car is now tyrannizing the city, it's, it's taken on an utterly despotic character, and the city remains either an afterthought, uh, with the, you know, those crumbling old buildings in the foreground, or a kind of mirage in the distance. Now we're really getting, you know, we're in our age, right, with the, this neo-Corbusian wet dream fantasy of substituting nature for for the real urban organism. And the reason why, and we've discussed this a lot, I think Andres has uh, articulated this very well, is we have no faith that whatsoever that the architects can deliver a decent habitat or that the planters can deliver a decent habitat, so the default setting now, of course, is nature. Um, it's a little hard to see on the, on the slide here, but can you tell that the, the guy in the blue shirt is pointing? Yeah. So like, what, what's he pointing at? Uh, dear, there are two dogs fucking down there under the oh. linden tree. <laughs> Who knows? All right, so now, you know, the, the, the fantasies are getting more grotesque simply because of the computer-aided design, you know. It, it makes it possible to, to tweak, warp, and torture every surface of the building without really working at it. You just feed an algorithm into your computer and bingo, it comes out, you've got your, your Frank Geary perfume bottle. But notice that where the red arrow is, the assumptions don't change that we're still going to have the six laners, right? That's all going to continue, uh, the, you know. This is the latest uh, on the ground iteration of the city of the future. Uh, and the, the most interesting thing about it, of course, is that it's a city with no future. But it's being touted as the city of the future. Um, the curb appeal here, of course, is the idea that everybody has a view. But what it ends up is that everybody has a view of nothing, except maybe an occasional sandstorm and a lot of ugly buildings. And uh, there's something about skyscrapers. Um, I've been twanging on this for a while, but I want to repeat it because I think it's important, OK? Um, the skyscraper's obsolete. Stop designing them. Stop building them. And most of all, stop giving in to the impulse to maximize the floor to area ratio of the building lot you, that you're dealing with. That is going to kill the city. These buildings will never be renovated. That's the problem. It's not the heat and the ventilation, and it's not the elevators. It's the fact that they'll never be renovated because 
because the capital resources and the material resources and the fabricated modular materials are not going to be there to renovate these buildings. They're one generation buildings. So stop building them and stop planning to have cities that are composed of them. It's a stupid idea. We've got to stop it. Uh, one of the ways of thinking about this, of course, is that there's going to be a magic moment. There's going to be a lot, a lot of magic moments in, in the near future for us. There'll be, for example, the magic moment when the tweet goes out from all the 27-year-old people that on Wednesday we'll all stop paying our college loans back. Wait for that to happen and see what that does to the banks. Another magic moment will be when all the people in any way involved in the ownership or tenancy of skyscrapers discover that they're no longer assets, they're liabilities. And that magic moment is coming. So, you know, in my opinion, uh, in, in my marginal opinion, uh, I think we're very lost and confused about what the real nature of the city is going to be, especially in the United States, uh, in the years to come. And uh, uh, the nature of the city is going to be defined by resource scarcity and capital scarcity and problems with uh, uh, the ecology and the environment. The oil story now is completely misunderstood. The American public wants to be misled and hosed about uh, the oil situation, but I can explain the oil situation very uh, succinctly for you in about a minute and a half, okay? You have the old oil, the old oil over here, which is the old Texas crude from, you know, 1930, 1940, 1950s, 60s. Uh, it costs $400,000 in today's money to drill one of those wells. It produced <laughs> thousands of barrels a day for 30 years. Okay, that was the old oil, the cheap oil. The new oil, the shale oil, costs between six and twelve million dollars per well in today's money to drill. Produces about a hundred barrels a day for the first year, and then goes into a fifty percent decline in the first year after the first year, and then it's out of business in five years. Okay, so thousands of barrels a day for three decades, a few hundred, a hundred barrels a day for three, four or five years. And that's it. And America thinks that we're going to keep on driving to Walmart forever on the basis of that. Okay? We're not paying attention. And that this story is going to really disappoint a lot of people. Um, of course, it, I don't want to belabor the climate change problems, the weather problems, and especially the water problems. They're becoming self-evident enough. But what a lot of people don't get is the connection between the end of cheap oil, the beginning of the expensive oil age, which is going to be rather brief, and the connection to the impairment of capital formation. Because you cannot accumulate new wealth if the cost of the primary resource for running your economy is really uh, uh, so out of reach that it crushes the economy. And that's really the problem that we're, that we're entering now and we're, we're uh, really unaware of it and how it is going to affect the future. Uh, you know, climate change, global warming, rising sea levels, we don't know how this is going to play out, could happen. The population story, that too is self-evident, doesn't need to be belabored, except to say this. A lot of people talk about it and yammer about it. We're not going to do anything about it. We're not, there's not going to be any policy, there's not going to be any protocol. What will happen is the usual suspects will come and they will do their thing. Uh, famine, starvation, conflict, war, violence, uh, disease, etc. Uh, you, you'll start to see the population curve go down. So we gotta get serious about how we're gonna think about the future of the city. <clears throat> I think what you're gonna see is the global economy is going to wither. It's already withering. It's going to wither even more harder. Um, the re trade relations and financial relations between the great nations of the world uh, are becoming strained. They're gonna get more strained. And what you're gonna see in the future, I believe, is that the economy of North America will be more internally focused. And one of the uh, implications of this is that the places th that will be important will be places on the inland waterways. And uh, uh, the places especially that will be important will be the place, the cities that exist at a scale that's consistent with the capital and resource realities of the future. 
Um, I think what we're going to see is that uh, we're going to lose control of our big cities, of our megaplexes, our great metropolises. We're not going to have the capital to maintain the infrastructure, uh, to really to take care of these places. You know, I had a really strange uh, um, kind of revelation walking across uh, Central Park not long ago from a hotel on the west side to the Met on the east side. And I realized the city has never been in such good shape in my lifetime. Central Park was immaculate, you know. The neighborhoods have all been brought back. Even the places when I was a kid where there's nothing but a wine house, you know. The Bowery is now a high rent district, right? But, you know, the reason for this is entirely due to the financialization of the economy. That's why New York is in the condition that it's in. That's why Brooklyn revived. That's why all the neighborhoods revived in Manhattan. But, you know, that we're now at the high point of that. And actually, we're going to now start another cycle down. And uh, I think what you're going to see is that our big cities are going to struggle mightily. And unfortunately, the cities that are overburdened with mega structures are going to struggle the most. So that's going to be New York City. That's the fate of New York City. I don't think most people don't get it because New York City seems to be so vibrant and so successful right now. But watch how that works out. So the cities that are going to be successful will be the smaller scale cities, the cities, uh, the smaller towns that, that probably show the most disinvestment and abandonment and dereliction in the landscape today. These are the places that are mo the most troubled and I think you're going to see them coming back especially the places that have a meaningful relationship with agriculture because that's going to be very important you know i can't i can't believe that intelligent people are wasting their time doing this you know you're going to build a 40 million dollar structure to grow cucumbers and zucchinis is absolutely <laughs> insane it's just more evidence of the techno narcissism that has taken over the collective mentality of america you know the you can have gardens in the city that that's a that's a proper part of the urban context to have gardens that's fine but the place for farming is not in the middle of the city. This idiotic notion that you know we've been hearing for the last 10 years that Detroit is going to become the new farming center of America. You know, there's a complete misunderstanding of how the transect operates. You know, and the, uh, the, the place to do the urban stuff is at the center of the urban place, and the place to do the rural stuff is on that beyond, at the edge and beyond the edge of the urban place. And I think that we're going to find out by necessity that that's how it works. So that that will be a sort of a rediscovery of the true typology uh, of urban and rural. That distinction, of course, got destroyed by the fiasco of suburbia, which did not only destroy the landscape, it destroyed our ability to process cognitively where we are on the landscape. But uh, this is uh, just a picture of a 19th century French uh, urban garden where they used to grow lettuces under these little glass hats. Um, so that they could extend the growing season and, and there would always be lettuce in, pa in Paris. Um, this is about as high-tech as you need to get. And you, don't need, you don't need a $40 million glass, you know, 10-story building. Just build yourself a cold frame. These happen to be very beautiful and elegant, of course. And these are the future farmers of America, the kids who are now beginning to pay off their college loans, who think they're going to be working in a cubicle for Old Navy or The Gap, doing marketing in 10 years. Forget it. <laughs> Buffalo is very fortunate. Uh, Buffalo is in uh, uh, one of the most amazing geographical locations in America. Uh, it's uh, between a, uh, uh, kind of a microclimate where wonderful agriculture is, is uh, they're, they're able to grow a lot of fruit here. Um, it's very temperate because of its, in the growing season, between the, uh, uh, the two lakes. And um, they also have access to probably the most massive hydropower site in America. Um, and uh, so Buffalo actually has the, the prospect of remaining uh, uh, civilized in ways that other part of the country, uh, other parts of the country don't. And of course the history of that in Buffalo is so really, it's only about a hundred year history. You know, you get the first power plants are kind of, you know, provisional sloppy, uh, uh, things are making it up as they go along. 
uh, but Buffalo begins to enjoy this this boom, this boon of of uh, plentiful electricity, and becomes the electric city, becomes really the Silicon Valley of 1900, the place that everybody's turned to in America to see what happens, because it's such a magical thing happening there. And um, you know, they have a demonstration of it at the Exposition of 1901, the World's Fair of 1901. And um, then the power plants get even larger and grander. And um, so by the time 1900 full comes along, you have uh, Buffalo is a, a, a wonderful city with the full urban kit of, of uh, uh, accessories and furnishings needed to make a wonderful place. So Buffalo learned how to do this. It enjoyed all of those opportunities and benefits of being where it was. Uh, uh, probably not necessary to, to tell you that its position on the Great Lakes was also extremely important because um, as the nation's economy becomes more internally focused, of course the Great Lakes are like a freshwater Mediterranean sea, they're deeply undervalued in America right now and their value will become greater and more self-evident uh, very soon in, in uh, the history to come. This is Niagara Square about a hundred odd years ago and you know there's not one embarrassing, disgraceful building in the picture, which is an amazing thing to say about America, especially the America of today, where there's almost never uh, a view that doesn't have something that's truly disgraceful in it. And uh, you know, the one we need to pay attention to now is this. It, how can you explain <laughs> what happened to the culture that it allowed it to deliver this disgraceful thing? You know, and we need to sort of reflect on that. And then, not only to deliver it, but to allow it to persist for 30 years. What kind of a de demoralized, discouraged, beaten down, intellectually bankrupt, morally bankrupt culture would allow this thing to sit in the most important public space in an important city for 30 years? So you gotta fix those things. And I just wanna remind you that we, we, uh, uh, we came from a culture that was capable of excellence, and if we really, uh, if we make that important, if we, if we make excellence important, instead of things like being innovation, uh, innovative, being on the cutting edge, you know, being on the cutting edge does not need to, to be as important as being excellent. If we can do those things, then we can choose to not be tragic. And uh, I, as I've had to tell uh, many a university audience over the years, because they, they no longer teach this in the, in the universities, life is tragic. Life is tragic. History doesn't care if we pound our civilization down a rat hole. So let's do better and let's choose not to be tragic. Bill. Thank you and good, good afternoon, everybody. I have to tell you, uh, I've been giving speeches in public settings for 30 years. And I can tell you what the three most terrifying words any public speaker can hear when he's preparing to give a speech, which are, counselors going first. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit, a bit, little smaller and possibly less dystopian scale about uh, about the future of cities, uh, particularly in upstate New York, where I grew up. And I think it's pretty obvious that, and Jim and I may have a different view of future prosperity, I think it's pretty obvious, and the whole reason that CNU exists and is so successful, is that the future of cities, and in fact the future of civilization, is all about placemaking. That is the, that, that's pretty obvious. That's the thing that you guys have uh, have so well articulated and implemented for 20 years. That is what is going to make cities. That's that suggests the resilience of cities. I think it can be difficult, however, to do that. Uh, having spent half my life in a very weak market and half my life in a very strong market, it is very difficult to do that effectively across a very large region that has been depressed for my entire life, and I'm getting old. So let me talk a little bit about uh, how I see that here in upstate New York and what I think the opportunities are. This is the only building I ever worked in that was designed by a famous architect. It is about a 10-minute walk from here. 
This is the, uh, the headquarters of the Buffalo News. Uh, it is actually, it's right by the arena, so I guess now it's a TOD, right? They're building a TOD right in front of it if you go down there. Um, this was designed by Edward Durrell Stone, bad even for him, right? Which is saying something. Um, <laughs> I worked in this building as a young reporter, uh, and I have to say it was just about the last, uh, oh, every newspaper I ever worked for was housed in a building like this, by the way, which suggests I was born a little too late in history. Um, but, but this was one of the last of many, I guess you might say, stressful ex in interactions with the built environment that I had growing up and being a young adult in upstate New York. Um, so why is, what is, why is it that my experience growing up in upstate is the source of the place-based PTSD that has driven my entire career and caused me to try to devote my career to creating better places? Well, I think it's partly because of what happened to my hometown, Auburn, which is 130 miles to the east of here. Um, a town, yes, was the hometown of William Seward, the hometown of, um, of Harriet Tubman. Also, I could go on and on, all kind of, uh, Joe Smith, Henry Fargo of Wells Fargo, I'll go on and on. A beautiful little town, a, a wealthy and prosperous factory town in its time. And when I was a kid, this is what it looked like. When I was a kid, this is what it looked like. When I was 10 years old, I could navigate the entire town without ever crossing a street that was, including, including US 20, without ever crossing a street that my parents were uncomfortable me on me crossing. The factories themselves were beautiful. Uh, this was the Columbian Rope Factory. <laughs> my grandfather was the head of the research lab at Columbian Rope. It was one of the most beautiful factories in the world. The rope was made by the twine going all the way around. The, 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 the factory was built around a central courtyard. And the, and the twine went all the way around the building while the rope was being created. That's how they did it. Let me, tell you, let me show you what happened. This is what happened to the downtown when I was a teenager. Uh, part of the problem was that Auburn was too well connected at HUD in those days. It was the wrong time in history to have friends at HUD. So we got plenty of money for urban renewal to tear down all those beautiful buildings. And at the same time, block away, uh, New York State DOT decided to build an arterial highway that just about destroyed all of the adjacent residential neighborhoods. Uh, and 40 years later, I have to tell you, nothing is different. It still looks like this. Because once they did this, there was no demand for anything. One of my first things that I wrote about as a young reporter almost 40 years ago was the unsuccessful attempt to try to get a developer to build something on the prime parcel that had been created by Urban Renewal. Finally, they said, oh, maybe Wegmans will come in. And there's been a Wegmans there for 40 years, which is now a good thing for the downtown to have terrible urban design. This is also the this is what the location of that factory looks like today. This is what we tore the factory building down to build in Auburn. So hence my PTSD. So, you know, the question I think is how do you in this environment create places and maintain great places and create resilient places and maintain them in a light market? across this vast region. It's kind of the same problem that you see in Detroit or Cleveland, except we're talking hundreds and hundreds of miles dotted with these little uh, settlements, mostly dating back to the 19th century, occasionally the 18th, that, are, that at one time in history were all quite beautiful. And it kind of depends on the local economy, right? Ithaca, you know, in Auburn, all the factories closed. 40 miles to the south in Ithaca, the factory is still there. It's called Cornell. That's why home prices in Ithaca are three times what they are in the surrounding towns. Skinny Atlas, which is seven miles to the east of where I grew up, has, is very prosperous basically by soaking up the market in central New York and greater Syracuse for all the, all the cutesy affluent suburbs. There's a market for that. Right, so Scanning Atlas was able to capture that. Um, 
and down near Rochester, Mount Morris, a kind of a down at the heels little town, uh, was able to use its proximity to Rochester and SUNY Geneseo to bring the downtown back to be cutesy and artsy, you know, and antique. So there's ways to do this in this light market, in this weak market of a regional economy that has, that has been stagnant in many ways for 60 or 70 years. The problem is, it's, not, it's very difficult for everybody to do that. The, the, you see, when you're here in Buffalo, those of you who are from out of town, you will see some really great neighborhoods and some really great things going on. This is Elmwood Avenue, right? Probably the best outlying neighborhood in Buffalo, one of the best in New York State. So there's, there's a market for these things in every city. The question is, what do you do when you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these places and the market doesn't exist to bring them all back? This is Gloversville. The, when you read a Richard Russo novel, this is the town you're reading about, Gloversville. That's where he grew up. That's where they made gloves. This now has Gloversville. I mean, no one has, tra no one has switched Gloversville over to artisan glove making, right? So, so Gloversville has the highest poverty rate in New York State. Similarly, just because a neighborhood is old does not mean that it is competitive. This is Hamilton Hill in Schenectady. It was built 100 years ago for workers at GE. And it's a pretty ordinary, fairly lousy, actually, set of, set of old housing stock that's obsolescent in a neighborhood that was thrown up quickly 100 years ago and doesn't have any amenities, okay? You can go to any city in upstate New York and you'll find neighborhoods like this, right? And all of them are struggling. And if you talk to the people who run Schenectady, they say, we have no idea what to do with this. We don't know. We don't know. At best, it's going down market. At worst, it's going vacant. We have no idea what to do. We have no idea what to do. They were lousy then, they're lousy now. This is true in Auburn. If you've ever been to Auburn, there's a state prison, right? The one factory that didn't leave, right? There's a state prison right in the middle of the town. You ever seen that in Auburn? Those of you from upstate New York? Not surprisingly, the neighborhoods across the street from the prison are kind of like this. They were thrown up 100 years ago, and they're not very good, and nobody really wants to live on, believe it or not, it's called Wall Street because it's across the street from the prison wall, and from the front, front window you see the turrets with the gun towers, right? <clears throat> and those neighborhoods are like this. Nobody knows what to do with those neighborhoods. So how, assuming that Jim's vision of the future is a little bit further out than you might think, and we have to deal with this question of a weak market for decades ahead in upstate New York, how do you revive the great places of upstate New York more broadly and consistently? It really isn't easy, unless you have a Cornell, or you are a Skinny Atlas, or you are a Saratoga Springs. What do you do? Well, I made a joke about artists and glove making in Gloversville, but there's actually one city that's successfully done that, right? And that is Cornell, Corning, which has transferred itself from a glass factory town to an artisan glass town. Very successful, right? There's ways to there's ways to build on the old industrial economy. It takes a lot of work. In Corning, they had a glass museum. The glass factory actually is still there, but they've managed to make this transition, building on the old industrial, uh, the 20th century infrastructure to begin to create a 21st century artisan economy. Uh, when you were down at if you were down at Silo City last night, that's kind of what you're beginning to see there. And if you heard Andreas's um, uh, inspiring talk last night, and he talked about Detroit, it's kind of what they're talking about. I will say something uh, as well that I've come to believe is that there is, a, uh, there is often a relationship between the engines of prosperity, which are often on the edge of town and are not new urbanist or smart growth, and the either older or newly created uh, high quality places that are often in the center of town which are smart growth. This is the corporate headquarters of Welch Allen, the medical device manufacturer just outside Skinny Atlas. It is obviously not a new urbanist development, right? But it is one of the things, it is one of the reasons why Skinny Atlas is prosperous. 
and the downtown of Skaneateles is prosperous in part because the people who, who work here, the people who own this place, value the high quality of place in Skinny Atlas. And I think we see that over and over again, this relationship between the factory at the edge of town, which is now at the edge of town, not in the middle of town anymore, and the prosperity of the middle of town. I often, in my many times in my life, I've driven up Route 12 from Binghamton to Utica, if you know where that is. And I have, and you go through town after town after town, and if the factory on the edge of town is open, the downtown is doing great, and if the factory on the edge of of town is closed, uh, then the downtown is doing terrible. So I think you have to recognize that the, indu the industrial and post-industrial economy sometimes requires heavy facilities uh, that may seem suburban and not new urbanist in nature, but nevertheless there's a symbiotic relationship between those and the new urbanist or smart growth places that you can create and can maintain. So it's not easy keeping even those things uh, this is a plant in Auburn that just shut air conditioning plant that the city tried really hard to keep and finally it's moving to Mexico. But I got to be honest with you, you know, the main street in my hometown looks better than it's looked in a really long time. I think that's partly because of the preference of the next generation, which has been discussed so much here, partly because many people that I grew up with have chosen to move home. There's two or three people, two or three families that I knew in LA who grew, that I grew up with in Auburn, who, and those folks have come back to run restaurants, to run theaters and stuff in downtown Auburn. So it's, so it's looking okay. And I, but, but I think the big question is, you know, what I used to say about upstate New York is, if you could figure out how to take the people who live here and move them into about one third of the villages and towns and cities and shut the other two thirds down, they would all be fabulous, right? They would all be fabulous. Now that's not going to happen. You have 200 years of history and 200 years of emotional connection. Um, but I think I think the fundamental question here, as I say, uh, 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 um, setting aside Jim, Jim's vision of the future for a minute, is if there remain there remains a relatively light market here, how can you get the critical mass of so many different places uh, to maintain them and, and enhance them? A similar problem, as I say to Detroit, where the downtown and midtown are doing great, the rest of the city is still struggling, except you're talking about this giant region, right, that has fabulous assets, that has many millions of people living in it, but that is extremely spread out and was set up for, an, for a booming economy uh, that doesn't exist anymore, and it's very, very hard to put those pieces together. Um, so, you know, I, I think, I actually think that the post-industrial world in upstate New York has a lot of amazing opportunities that we haven't thought about before. I was, when we were down at Silo City last night, um, my cousin Greg Johnson, who's in the audience who lives in Buffalo, uh, said, oh yes, this is where I put in to go kayaking the other day, right? Now imagine 40 years ago kayaking down by the grain elevators, right? Probably never happened. You wouldn't want to do it. In Auburn now, the best fly fishing is right in the river, right outside where the factories used to be. You, you literally go and stand on the old raceways in your waders. And I can tell you, when I was a kid, you wouldn't want to eat a fish that came out of that river, believe me, if you could find one. So I actually think that there's a new relationship that can be created between nature and these cities in the post-industrial age, if we do it right, that actually enhances the place qualities. My concern, and I'm not quite sure what to do with it, is how to get enough energy and enough economic uh, uh, prosperity going at least in the next decade or two so that you can save, recover, restore enough of these places so that Upstate again has a critical mass and is using its, its great places to its best effect. Um, so. Uh, that is the concern I always have when I come home. I love coming home and talking to you about that. Thank you for listening, and I can't wait to see what Jim has to say next. Jim and Bill, thank you both for very exciting presentations, very interesting, very provocative. Bill, you've served as an elected official, and we all may want uh, the changes that we see in, in uh, 
good planning, we want to have it happen now, we want a prosperous future, but it takes a team of the citizens working with elected officials and also their employees. Do you want to comment on what it's like to be an elected official working with the public and working towards a future? Well, first of all, you have to be crazy to run for office. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether that, I mean, I, I, as a veteran of elected office, I tend to say that proudly, but it's actually of great concern, right? Um, that that the, 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 the emotional punishment is so great, and the frustrations are so great, and typically the financial rewards especially are so few, and you're expected to give up your entire life for it. Um, that you really do have to be crazy. And so I am very concerned that we cannot get, uh, that we cannot get the quality of people to run for office as we should. You know, quite a few years ago, Ellen Ehrenholt, who was the editor of Governing Magazine, um, wrote a book about office, people who seek office. One of the chapters actually was about Utica and the decline of an organized political class in Utica. And, 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 and basically what he said was um, two, you know, a, a, a narrow group of people run for office in the United States and usually for the wrong reasons, right? It's to get their name in the paper or to, to have the perception of power or something like that rather than actually trying to get things done. So I, I don't think it's really about the office holders. I think it's about a civic and political culture that is determined to get things done and to change things. So, uh, when you look at in Buffalo and elsewhere, I think that you can learn a lot of lessons from particularly Pittsburgh and Cleveland, which long ago reached the point where they realized that bickering with each other and having a million governments and, 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 and fighting over crumbs was counterproductive and they actually had to work together to, to bring their regions back, which they did especially in Pittsburgh and to a lesser extent in Cleveland. Jim, you see a future way ahead of the rest of us. You see what's coming, you see more devastation, more pain, more hurt from change. Do you have a comment about how we might educate our elected officials to be prepared for a future that is going to be painful and disruptive? Uh, uh, you're making an inference actually about uh, the whole pain and torment thing. That, that's actually not what I'm saying. That's an inference that you're making. Okay. Um, Except it. Uh, you know, I, what I, I don't think it's a matter of uh, instructing or educating leaders. I think we have a, a consensus that uh, is, uh, is not working for us because we're not able to tell ourselves a story about what's happening to us uh, that's coherent. And because we can't tell ourselves a coherent story, we can't arrive at any kind of coherent plan of action about what to do about our predicament. Uh, I will, would point, for example, to the idea that we use the term, you know, just in this session we've used the term post-industrial economy more than once, but we don't really mean it. We say post-industrial economy, well, the expectation is we're going to have a post-industrial economy with industry of the kind that we've known, you know? But a post-industrial economy is really a post-industrial economy, and I don't think we get it. You know, I don't think we get it. I, every, I, I get uh, letters from every, every day from cranks who tell me that, uh, you know, every activity in America is going to move to the internet. You know, what are they thinking? The electric grid in the United States is so decrepit, it requires a trillion dollars just to fix it, to keep it running the way it's running now. You know, but we're assuming that uh, we're assuming that uh, electric service is going to continue to be reliably 24/7, 365 days a year. You know, we're going to be really disappointed about how that works out. A lot of people think that we're going to run Walmart, Walt Disney World, the interstate highway system, the medical racket, uh, and Disney World on some combination of uh, solar, uh, wind, um, dark matter, used vegetable oil. Um, you know, and other fantasies. You know, that's not going to happen. We're going to be disappointed about how that works out. So the idea, for example, that the local economies are going to be saved by in, by corporate giant corporate UFOs continuing to land in them. You know, that forget it. That's not going to happen. 
what I think you're going to see happen, and what we're not paying any attention to at all, the main consequence of what history is telling us about the future is that we're going to have to relocalize everything we do, and we're going to have to downscale everything we do, and we're going to have to downscale and rebuild local economies at a fine grain, multi-layered, um, and that's going to give people vocations, things to do, role, social roles, economic roles, all the things they're missing now can be replaced by local economic activity, but it may not be the kind of society that you're used to. You know, so, so check all your assumptions at the door about what your future is going to be. And, and probably the one thing that, I, that is most important to realize is that everything organized at the giant scale, whether it's a Frank Geary condo building or, or the Ramjack Corporation or the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development or, or Disney World or anything, Walmart, anything organized at the large level is going to fail. And we're going to have to reorganize these things at a much smaller scale. And we don't want to think about it. We don't want to hear about it. Because we, we want to keep on driving to Walmart forever by other means. That's really what we want to do. OK, Bill, I'm going to shift to questions just a little bit. We've talked about building on assets. What assets do you see in the Western New York or uh, Central New York area? Well, I think uh, I, I want to answer that question partly by acknowledging a lot of the things that Jim said that I think are right. Um, I, it, it's what we're doing, to begin with, generally speaking, in our economy, what we're doing is manufacturing is becoming like agriculture. It is worldwide, there is more and more productivity and fewer and fewer workers. So to go back to the factories in upstate New York that, that employed thousands of people is just never going to happen. That does free up, you might call it productive capacity of people to do other things. And I think what we do see all over the country, and particularly in some of the older industrial cities, is the leading edge of exactly what Jim is talking about, which is relocalizing a more artisan approach to lots of things, people kicking around looking for something to do, coming up with interesting things, and those things finding a market. Um, I think that's a really, really good thing. Um, the assets here, uh, I think, are pretty well known to everybody. Uh, it, it does include the water power, it, it does include the access to the Great Lakes, it includes the great educational and research institutions that upstate New York has. It does include some manufacturing know-how still as well. Um, I think these assets are underutilized for several reasons. Um, one is that, as I said, they are so far apart from one another. It's really hard to create a Silicon Valley out of, out of Roswell Park, UB, RIT, uh, Syracuse and Cornell when they are not each three miles apart from each other, which is the which is the which is the way it is in La Jolla, where I where I uh, in San Diego where I work where you have the center of the world's biotech economy because the equivalent institutions of what I just described which are hundreds of miles apart here are all basically at the same freeway off ramp. Um, so that's that's one reason why I think it is difficult to uh, maximize the to maximize those assets. Um, uh, a second reason that I think it is difficult to maximize the assets, which has been discussed repeatedly here, is the fact that this region has not been attracting and keeping its share of the next generation for the last two or three generations, and I'm a good example of that, right? I left in the late 70s because I saw no economic opportunity here ever in my lifetime, right? So um, to, to, to not be able to keep those folks or, or attract those folks in comparison to Texas or California or Boston um, really is an enormous, uh, is an enormous detriment. And, 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 and the, the tragedy that I see is you see this tremendous, uh, these tremendous technological breakthroughs in the research institutions that then are, the, 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 the economic productivity of which are transferred out of the region. They are never connected back to, back to the manufacturing capacity in the region 
or, or, or the medical capacity in this region, they are largely transferred to other places to be commercialized. A lot of the tech transfer stuff at Cornell, for example, goes to Silicon Valley and stays there. So they get richer and richer and richer, and, and, and you guys here continue to stagnate. And, and the last thing I have to say, you know, one of the things that I say, say about upstate, you know, I've lived in California now for basically 30 years. And, and one of the things that I, I say to people when they ask me what it was like in upstate New York is, upstate New York has been economically stagnant and struggling for my entire lifetime. Um, and that's a really extraordinarily long time. And I think there is a confidence problem as well. There is a confidence problem as well. The people in upstate New York just don't quite believe that it's possible uh, to to be, uh, it, they know that living here is great and it's a great place, that's why they live here. There are a lot of great things about living here, but they just don't quite believe that it can come back and be prosperous in a way that increases everybody's uh, material well-being and everybody's quality of life, which is why I think that the leading engines that the trends Jim talk, talked about are potentially very powerful, right? Because you cannot, in San Diego, you don't have Silo City in San Diego, right? You know, when we have it, it'll be a hundred years from now. It'll be out in the suburbs, and it'll be the ruins of some of Qualcomm, right? Of wireless telecommunications manufacturing. It won't be nearly as fun or interesting. So I think what I've seen in the last ten years is a growing pride in the fact that this place has an industrial history, has a magnificent, very interesting history and that the remnants of that are the foundation on which one can build a new kind of life and a new kind of economy. It's not just, you're, you're not just playing out the string living here, which I think is what my generation thought. You're actually, part as in Detroit, you're actually participating in something really cool that's at the, that the leading edge that can't be replicated elsewhere. So that's where the, that's the hope, that's, that's the asset that I see that has been underutilized for a long time and I now see emerging and it's really exciting. Jim, you've written about uh, handmade, about the power of creativity, a um, little bit finer grain, close to the ground. Do you want to talk about assets that might be a little different than the ordinary ones? You've already mentioned the power project and fresh water, but you might come at that question a little bit differently. Uh, I wrote a series of novels that I'm still writing. Uh, the, the first one was called World Made by Hand, and it was an attempt to depict in uh, uh, really uh, uh, kind of visceral uh, uh, terms the predicaments that I was describing in my nonfiction books, A Long Emergency and Too Much Magic. And uh, so these are novels that take place in the not too distant future. The first one was World Made by Hand, the second one was The Witch of Hebron, and the third one is coming out in uh, August called The History of the Future. And uh, it's really a, really a description of uh, an economy and a society that uh, has downscaled radically and has had to let go of a lot of the comforts and conveniences that we consider to be normal. And it's no more simple than that. Uh, I want to say one more thing about the assets, though, that um, it is generally believed that uh, eds and meds uh, colleges, universities, schools, and hospitals and healthcare will be the saviors for places like Buffalo and, and many, many other places across the nation. But I want to remind you something of something. Both of these activities now have become unconscionable rackets. They have become criminal enterprises. And the idea that we want to make that the basis of our economy is really misguided. You know, we have to radically disassemble those rackets and 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 rehumanize them. You know, and the idea that you see these giant medical uh, complexes arising in the ruins of places like Buffalo and think it's a good thing. You know, you think that it's a good thing that when somebody goes into one of those big hospitals with a hangnail and ends up with a five thousand dollar bill and loses their house because of it. If that's a good thing, you know, I don't think that's a good thing. And I, I think we have to look elsewhere for what the base of the economy is going to be and that. So that I, I'm sorry to say that to say these things, 
And I'm sorry to say that, that this country tries my Christian patience, and I'm not even a Christian. <laughs> I, I, w I wanted to pick up on something Jim said and reframe it slightly because I think he makes a good point, which is that many, many cities, particularly cities in decline, have focused on eds and meds, that is to say universities and the medical sector, because those are landlocked in those cities, they're not moving to Asia. Um, but I think the point Jim makes is quite, and, and so, so there are many economic development strategies hang on those. Uh, but I think the point Jim is making is quite right, which is that those are the two biggest drags on the national economy. And, and at the national level, in order for, to be, for us to be prosperous, we're gonna have to fix that. And when we fix that, that's gonna be bad for all those economic development strategies in all those cities. So I, part of it is understanding which pieces of those economic sectors are gonna be truly value added versus which pieces of those are simply a drag on the economy as Jim described. Sometimes uh, in the medical industry, and so in San Diego, medical and biomedical is an enormous industry. Um, Sometimes you see a research breakthrough that com gets commercialized into a product that allows doctors to do another test, which drives up the cost, like Jim said. Sometimes you see a research breakthrough for, it could be a drug, it could be a test, it could be something, it could be research to improve uh, a disability that actually will lower the cost uh, to the consumer in the end. Um, and, I, and I think it, it, in economic development terms, you have to differentiate between those two things. People don't do that. But Jim is quite right that the, whether or not you think it's a criminal racket, um, it, Jim is quite right that, that those things are a drag on the national economy even as they, all, even as they provide the basis of prosperity, what prosperity many declining cities have, and that's a disconnect that everyone working on placemaking and economic development in cities is gonna have to address in the next few years. Uh, let me just respond to that for one minute. I, the fact that we don't even recognize that these are criminal rackets is a problem because it's so self-evident, it's so obvious. You know, that we're pretending that, we're pretending, for example, that the college loan racket is okay. That it's okay to burden these kids with $50,000 worth of debt, you know, when they turn 22 years old. You know, what a terrible thing to do to young people. You know, what a terrible thing to do to any people, to, you know, to, to let them go to a hospital. And the, the medical uh, racket is basically a hostage racket. Because when you need them, and when you go to them, you know, uh, they can do anything, they can charge you anything they want because you need them so desperately. You know, so you end up getting charged $14,000 to, to have a broken arm set, you know? It's, it's, it's really ridiculous that we don't even, um, that it's not common knowledge that these are rackets that need to be, you know, that, that need to be uh, disassembled. So, uh, I don't even understand why, why we regard them with any respect given the destruction that they're uh, uh, having in the American uh, scene. Okay, we've got one more topic. Both of you have a very strong opinion of what the future is going to bring. So what does excellence look like? Well, excellence looks like paying attention to the details and uh, caring about what you're doing and having to live with the consequences of it in the place where you are. So that you're not just some, you know, company coming from far away or some architect coming from far away and, and just doing something to a locality and then you leave. I guess that's another way of saying excellence is handmade, right? right? Kind of? Well, it's personal. It's, you know, it's fabricated whatever way that you fabricate it, but it's, it's done with care. Right. Uh, 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 you know, my father used to say, so today's the 70th anniversary of D-Day, right? And my father, when I asked my father why, when I was about 12, I asked him why we won World War II. And he said, well, and remember, my, he worked at a locomotive plant during the war in Auburn. And, I, and, and he said, well, here's, here's why we won World War II. If you want a really, really good tank and you don't know when you, don't care when you get it, you go ask the Germans to make it for you. 
And if you need a thousand really good tanks by Tuesday, you get the Americans to do it, right? Uh, back then. So I think um, the message that we're both saying is that the mass production society, that, that mass produced everything in the 20th century, is playing itself out. And so we've got to find ways to, uh, and I think excellence means everything Jim said, but it means on a more global scale that we have to understand how to have a productive economy, how to keep people um, uh, doing interesting things in which they can earn a living, and do it in a, in a, in a more artisan and handcrafted and, and place-based way. Now that doesn't mean everything will be local. Right? Because even in the, when we look at the great places of 100 years ago that we all love, they were mass produced in a certain way as well by architects and by capital. Uh, but, we have to, but, but, but we have to understand how to transform ourselves to the 21st century economy where uh, things do have to pay, done with more care and, 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 and pay attention and be, and enduring. You know, Jim often uses this word enduring, and I think that's right. That I think that the, one of the things where Jim's exactly right is that in the post-war world, a lot of things that we did were cheap. We could do them cheaply, so we did them in a disposable way and we threw them all away. And I think the big difference now in excellence is to make more things, particularly in the built environment, that are enduring and flexible and resilient uh, so that we can live with them and reuse them in new ways over and over again um, in the 21st century. All right, thank you all for joining us and please help us thank our presenters for their wonderful session.